Hello, you beautiful princes of Maine, you kings of New England, you dukes of Domino's Pizza. I think it's time your dear old Uncle Armored Otter sat you down and we had a chat about components. <laughs> I know, gross, right? You don't want an old kook like me telling you about this stuff and embarrassing you, but uh, listen, I'd rather you hear it from me than from your pals down at school, especially that Jeremy kid. He's a real troublemaker. Anywho, let's do the damn thing. Components are one of those things that's super straightforward on the surface, but it gets complicated simply because there are so many choices. So the main focus of this video is to help cut through the clutter by pointing out great components that can elevate your build both in the early game and the late game. But first, some bookkeeping. First, if you're a returning player from a while back, you'll notice that you no longer have to assemble components. Additionally, these components drop at the same rate as their fragments, making components three to four times more available than before, so go hog wild, which feeds right into my next point. Don't hoard components. Use them freely. You should have every single piece of gear equipped with a component from at least level 15 on. You'll almost always have everything you need to craft simply by playing the game passively. Next, components attached to weapons and offhands always come packed with unique ability. Some are passive, while others are active. If you have the same passive granting components in both your main hand and offhand, those auras can and do stack, so long as you cast each unique iteration of the buff from your hotbar. For example, if you have a purified salt in your main hand and offhand, you can have two unique instances of the Aether Ward buff, granting you double Aether resistance. About two-thirds of the way through Act 1, you will unlock an NPC that will allow you to either reclaim a component by destroying the piece of gear it's attached to, or can destroy the component, letting that piece of gear be enchanted with a different component. You can find this NPC type in various other places throughout the game, and will be denoted by a pair of gears over their head. Finally, there's a metric ton of components, and they all have valid uses in every build, so to make it simple, I'm going to focus primarily on components that are useful for every character. With that in mind, let's jump in to the best early game components. Anti-Venom Salve is an absolute workhorse of a component. The flat armor and health regen can go a long way in the early game, but the 20% poison and acid resistance is the standout here. Poison and acid is an incredibly common damage type in Act 1, and stays pretty relevant throughout the game, especially in Act 3. This, coupled with the fact that this component can be attached to any piece of armor including belts and boots, makes it flexible and easy to use to great effect. Silk Swatch gives you 18% bleeding and pierce resistance, two incredibly common damage types that are used quite evenly throughout the game. This component is relegated to shoulder, chest, and leg armor, so you have to be a bit more choosy about which components get slotted in on those pieces of armor, but even with two Silk Swatches, you get up to almost 40% pierce and bleeding resistance alone. Scaled Hide increases your armor absorption across every piece of gear you have equipped. In layman's terms, this means you get hit for less damage against regular attacks, which is helpful for in-your-face punchy bosses or big groups of run-of-the-mill weenies. I generally only use one Scaled Hide when leveling a character, but most characters can use up to two before capping their armor absorption. Wardstone offers up an 18% bonus to four different resistances, meaning 18% to all three elements, fire, cold, and lightning, as well as 18% to bleeding, and 6% movement speed on top, making this the mac daddy of leveling components. Even though Wardstone is relegated to metal and amulet slots, I make sure any character I level uses both. Mark of the Traveler is a boots-only component, giving you 8% movement speed as well as a metric ton of flat health regen, which is very strong in the early game. Between Mark of the Traveler and Double Wardstone, you should be rocking a persistent 20% bonus to move speed, making you the zippity zoopiest guy around. Corpse Dust is my go-to ring component for any leveling build that is not energy hungry. 4% health and 10% vitality resistance, as well as a modicum of health regeneration, isn't going to make or break anything, but it does make your character a bit more resilient, and Corpse Dust is readily available throughout the game. Ectoplasm is the miracle cure for any build that has problems managing energy, both by deepening your energy pool by 200 and by giving you a massive 3 energy regen per second. A single ectoplasm is usually what you need to stave off the energy potion spam in the early game. For the really energy intensive builds like Albrecht's Ether Ray or Siphon Souls, a second ectoplasm might be required. Now, on to the end game portion of the video, or as I like to call it, the Ugden Bloom Zone. Uten Bog Leather is the upgraded anti-venom salve, but instead of offering flat armor and health regen, you get 20% bonus bleeding resistance as well as the much sought after defensive ability. Much like anti-venom salve, Ugden Bog Leather can be attached to any piece of armor, including belts and boots, two slots which generally aren't very flexible. 
Spell Scorch Plating is a good alternative to Ugdenbog Leather if your bleeding and poison resistance are already at a comfortable level. While you'll be missing out on 30 defensive ability from Ugdenbog Leather, you'll be trading it in for 100 flat health and a larger overall pool of resistances. Bloodied Crystal is my go-to ring component for any character that does not rely on a shield, boasting an impressive 75 armor which bolsters every piece of gear equally, 15% bleed resist, and a whopping 40 defensive ability. Bloodied Crystal is a vital component for almost any late game build. Living Armor, above all else, is a way to elevate your armor absorption rating without losing out on other primo stats by edging out the outleveled scaled hide. The 35 offensive ability is an incredibly valuable stat for endgame consistent DPS, and both elemental and chaos resistance are handy to ensure our resistances are either capped or overcapped. Sacred Plating serves a very similar purpose to Living Armor, getting your armor absorption rate to an acceptable level with no wasted stats. Aether Resistance can be a tough stat to come by, even in the late game, and getting 18% from a single source can be very valuable, and 210 flat health is something that no build would turn their nose up at. Seal of Annihilation is just about the ultimate amulet component. While the 5% attack and cast speed are both very valuable, the real reason to pick this up is the proc, which reduces an enemy's offensive and defensive ability by 55 each. In simple terms, this means that any enemy struck by this proc has a harder time hitting and critting you, and in turn is more susceptible to your hits and crit. Finally, Prismatic Diamond is my go-to component for headwear. This is another component that we pick up, not for its stats, but for its proc. The 4% bonus to health and 15% vitality resistance are nothing to sneeze at, which is a weird phrase because are you just sneezing at things you don't like? What a weird reaction to things. But I digress. The proc on Prismatic Diamond is what's known as a Circuit Breaker, an ability that automatically triggers when your health gets low, staving off death for a little while. In this case, this is done with a flat 130 damage absorption, which may not sound like much, but in reality will allow your character to shrug off most incremental damage, as well as all but the strongest single attacks. That's all for this guide. Thanks for checking out my video and I hope you found it helpful. If it was, consider showing me some love by liking, subscribing, commenting, or sending me a Lunchable. I'm really hungry. I've got other handy Grim Dawn guides on my channel as well as other Grim Dawn videos which have been described as acceptable. Until next time. May your dreams be sweet and your nightmares be spooky monster scary and not grandma died scary.